evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Nantasket Beach Lecture Series. We're pleased to have you all here in attendance tonight. As many of you know, this is a co-sponsored program put on by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Friends of the Hull Public Library, and the Hull Life Saving Museum. Um, we do have, there were a lot of questions today about being able to view um, the talks that have happened um, over the past couple months and then also moving forward. We're really lucky to have Greg Bennett from Hull Cable Access Television yeah. who's taping these lectures. So they are available on Hull Cable Access TV. And if you're computer savvy, he also has a YouTube, um, YouTube site where you can see some of the lectures on your computer. So um, tonight I'd like to introduce our very own Victoria <coughs> Stevens from the Hull Life Saving Museum. She is the curator there and is one of the co-sponsors of this event to organize all of our lectures and all of our speakers. So we're really excited to have her be, being able to actually speak to all of you tonight. Uh, she earned a bachelor's in art history at Harvard University and completed the museum studies program at Tufts University. Victoria worked at Fogg Museum and the Peabody Essex Museum but jo before joining the staff at the Hull Life Saving Museum. And while she's been at the Life Saving Museum, Victoria has helped develop the Boston Harbor Islands shipwreck website. So it's no surprise that she's going to be speaking us, to us tonight about the shipwreck located, or that was revealed just off of Ken Burma Street. Um, she also wanted me to let you know that there will be um, books, shipwrecks in and around Boston Harbor that will be for sale for $15 after the lecture. So please join me in welcoming Victoria Stevens. I can't hold the microphone like Jess can, so uh, can you hear me? That, how's that? No? No? <laughs> Let's get a little closer. How's that? Does that work? Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you for the opportunity to talk here tonight. Um, before I get started, I do have a picture on the uh, screen that's not related to the talk, and I just wanted to take this opportunity for one more announcement while we um, are here tonight that um, the Life Saving Museum today took on a major project to move our fourth order for now lighthouse lens from the second floor to the first floor, where it'll be much more accessible for exhibits. So if you haven't seen it, please stop in and take a look. And I particularly wanted to thank Daly and Wanzer, who came and moved it for us, and they just did a fantastic job. So um, if you see them around town, <laughs> say, say thank you for us. Um, so tonight I am going to be talking about the shipwreck on Ken Burma Beach. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, tell, provide some information because I've been hearing a lot of questions around town about what's going on with the wreck and um, what's happening there. And I will tell you that we may not have all the answers. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we really just haven't figured out yet, but um, I'd love to give you an opportunity, take this opportunity to update you on where we are. So this is a picture of the shipwreck uh, about a month ago on Ken Burma Beach and it was Richard Green who took this photograph who was the one who called the Life Saving Museum and let us know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Apparently, uh, timbers had been gradually surfacing through the beach for about a week or two before that, and local people who walked the beach had been seeing them and um, just kind of gradually realizing that it was more than driftwood there. Um, so Richard Green gave us a call, and we went down and took a look, to, and, and it was clearly a ship. Uh, so this is the ribs of the ship coming up through the sand, and that's what was pretty much plainly visible when we first went down. So the first thing that I did when I heard about this was to call Vic Mastone, um, who fortunately I had worked with a little bit in the past and, and knew that he was the person to get down to the shipwreck site. Vic Mastone is the chair and the director of the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. Um, so he is responsible for any archaeological materials underwater in Massachusetts, um, be they salt water along the coastline or inland, um, Native American machines, anything that's uh, archaeological material underwater is all in Vic's domain. Um, so I gave him a call and fortunately he was able to come down the next day. Uh, so this is a picture of Vic just taking some preliminary measurements of the planking. This is some of the planking and then he's trying to get some um, distances on the vessel as well. So what is it? That's what everybody wants to know, right? Uh, and we don't really know for sure. You know, we have a lot of information and we have some good guesses. So it's most likely a coasting schooner, probably a two or three masted coasting schooner. Um, that was the most common vessel in that area. Um, based on what we're seeing, it's most likely um, 1850 to 1900, sort of mid to late 19th century ship. 
Uh, that was the height of coasting activity in this area, so that makes sense as well. Based on what we're seeing, we've uncovered about 60 feet in length, and we know that we're not seeing the full length of the ship. So based on the size of the frames and the length of what we've uncovered, we're estimating about 100 to 120 foot vessels. So a good size schooner, probably um, a two to three master. I'm guessing more like three master on that size. And it's oak frames with pine planking. So for those who are not very familiar with schooners, I just want to include, um, this is what, this is a coasting schooner called the Australia, uh, the remains of which is now on exhibit at Mystic Seaport. So if you want to get a, a look at what a ship like this might have looked like more intact, you can go down and see the Australia. Uh, this is what it looked like under sail. And this is what it looks like at Mystic. Uh, so you can actually go inside the vessel and walk down, which is a, a good experience. So what we're seeing is pretty far down below the waterline, probably uh, along the bilge. And just for reference, the Australia, I believe, is about 70 feet long. Um, so we're quite a bit longer, the ship that we're seeing, a larger ship. So one of the things that I had the real pleasure of doing um, while working at the Life Saving Museum is to go out to the National Archives in Waltham and read through all of the rec reports and log entries for the station um, from about 1889 to 1902. And one of the um, projects that I took on while doing that was to choose a year um, which in this case is 1890, and make a tally. When they lifesavers filled out the log for the station, one of the things they would do is tally how many sloops, how many schooners, how many steamers passed through Nantasket roads each day. Um, so this is a tally of all these vessels for one year. And you can see they had 32 ships, 296 barks, 221 brigs, 7,784 schooners, and 3,750 steamers. Um, so you can see that schooners are by far the most prevalent vessel. So it makes sense um, that the ship that we have on the beach would be a schooner. It averages out to about 150 a week. So they really were ubiquitous along the coastline. Uh, I'm going to show you a few. None of these are the ship. I, you know, I can tell you <laughs> these are not the one. Um, but just so you get an idea of what the vessels were like, these are. This is the Henry Tilton, which wrecked right across from where the Life Saving Museum is on Stony Beach um, in 1898 during the Portland Gale. Um, the crew of that ship were taken off by breaches buoy by the Life Savers. This is the Maddie Eaton, which. You know, if we pulled back the curtains, would be right there in 1888, right in front of the hotel. This is the Hotel Nantasket in the background, and this was on Nantasket Beach. Uh, the Maddie Eaton came ashore in the Great Storm of 1888, which was one of the most devastating storms that the Lifesavers of Hull faced. Um, in this case, uh, they did rescue 29 men from five ships during that storm. However, the Maddie Eaton came far, so far up the beach that the crew didn't require rescue. They were able to walk off at low tide. I think they did refloat it, yeah. yeah. And this is the H.C. Higginson that was wrecked right at the bottom of Atlantic Hill. So you can see many, many schooners you know, that wrecked along this area. So it's, it's not easy to distinguish which one we might have. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that process. Um, so is, this is just an illustration of schooner construction. So mainly when you're looking at those pictures on the beach, what you're seeing are the timbers or the frames here. And you can see some of the exterior planking and also the ceiling um, planking on the inside. Now, the day that Vic came down, he was able to take some preliminary measurements, but unfortunately, he had a field study out of state that had been previously scheduled, and there's nothing he could do. He had to go, so he wasn't able to get back for about two weeks. Um, but fortunately, the next day, we at the Life Saving Museum had a group of Coast Guard personnel who were already scheduled to come do some community service, which they do with us periodically. Um, so I called up the person who had set up the, the day, and I said, you know, I know you were going to do some gardening around the museum, <laughs> but we have a shipwreck, and how would you like to excavate a shipwreck? And they said, okay. So they came down, and um, these guys were terrific. They spent several hours digging out the shipwreck um, with some guidance that Vic had given us on how to do it and what we could document. And there's um, Don Ritz, who's in our audience tonight from the Hull Historical Commission, who was also very helpful. Um, this was an exciting moment because at this point we were able to excavate, um, Don, would you say about 14 feet? Where is Don? I can't find him. Yeah, about 14 feet on the end piece. 
So from what we could measure, we from the end piece here, which we're not actually sure, there's some debate whether it's a bow or a stern, but we're sure it's an end. Um, <laughs> so, so estimating uh, on the distance we saw there, we think about 24 foot um, a beam for the vessel. And here's an illustration just for uh, size. You can get an idea that these are very, a very sturdily built vessel from the size of the timbers. And this is a trunnel hole, um, which is how the planking would have been attached to the frames. So, let's see. I'm going to skip forward, I think. See. There's a, this is the trunnel. Um, so that's a tree nail or trunnel. It's the wooden peg that would be used to attach the planking to the frames of the ship. I have to say it's really cool to be able to reach into the sand and put your hand around one of those and, and know it was put in there 100 years ago. Um, and there's Don holding one of the trunnels that was loose on the beach. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, this is, um, he's pounding in a trunnel to attach the planking to the frame of a ship. I'm just going to back up to where we were. Um, so that's um, one of the holes. Now the holes are always round, but the trunnels can be either kind of square and rough if they were uh, hand cut, or they can be pretty round and smooth if they were lathed. Um, it's hard to sell on a ship that's been under the water for this amount of time, but Vic Mastone feels pretty confident that these were lathed, which would mean post-Civil War. Um, so we're probably you know, after the 1860s for the date. And this is just an illustration of a ship under construction to show you the ceiling. Um, this is the planking on the interior of the vessel, and you can see that. I think this is getting near the end. Don't you think, Don, where these pieces were a little reinforced? So this is sort of beyond the regular ceiling planking and getting down to the end piece where it's reinforced a little bit more. Um, but here you can see the ceiling planking on one side and the exterior planking on the other, and you can see a trunnel hole right there and another trunnel coming up. And this is just an illustration of the, a ship under construction, so you can see how they're putting the planking on. So now we know the basic vessel that we have. We know it's probably a late, mid to late 19th century schooner of about 100 um, to 120 feet. So now we can go to our shipwreck chart. Um, and this is a shipwreck chart that was made by a, a terrific historian who's here tonight, um, Bob Sullivan, who was generous enough to share it with the museum. And um, well, it's not comprehensive, there may be ships that are not on this chart. It's a very good place to start. Um, so going to uh, the chart, this is a cluster of ships that are in the general area of the Ken Burma shipwreck. Now, of course, over 100 years, they could shift a little bit up or down the beach, so we can't be 100% sure um, that the location on the chart is where the actual ship is. Um, so now the process that we have to go through, um, and it's an interesting process, is to go through each of these ships and try to go through the primary source materials and the documentation of what happened at the time of the wreck and identify, um, mostly by a process of elimination. If we can eliminate that it couldn't possibly be the ship that's on the beach, then we can narrow that down. So my first thought when I heard about the wreck was, could it be the Lassay, um, which was a French brig, would have been really exciting for me because it was the first ship that Joshua James earned a medal um, going out on a rescue to. It was in 1850. But with um, just a little bit of research, um, it was clear that the James family was involved in refloating the ship after the wreck. So not the Lassay, but this is the medal that he earned on April 1st, 1850. Um, so I went on to the next ship. And this time I got pretty excited. This is the Bucephalus, and um, this is a, an excerpt from um, Bob Sullivan's book, which we have over here tonight. And it says, the Bucephalus, a schooner from Provincetown with salted fish, was forced up on the Long Beach section of Hull on February 1st, 1882. Her hull was deep in the sand near the Ocean House, a favorite summer hotel. Following the storm, the vessel stood as straight and stately as though she was afloat. So I got pretty excited. Her, vessel, you know, her hull was already deep in the sand. So I got in touch with Vic Mastone. I said, I think we, you know, this is a good um, possibility. And he got excited too. Um, but he called me the next day and let me know that he had found the Bucephalus listed in the ship's register for the following year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so mad. <laughs> but I still have questions, you know, because it, 
there could be many ships named the Bucephalus, so then you have to look, is it the same owner, is it the same home port, is it the same size vessel? Um, so that's where we get into the finer points to look a little bit further. Um, but the, the Bucephalus does seem to match, so I don't think it's the Bucephalus. This is a fragment of a ship that we have at the museum. I love this little artifact. It's about that big. Um, and it says, a piece of the brig Alice wrecked at Kinburma on Long Beach, November 26, 1888. Um, this was during the great storm. And that was the storm where Joshua James and the crew went out and saved 29 people from five ships. Um, so I have not seen that the Alice was removed from the beach yet. That doesn't mean it wasn't. I've started to go through the ship's registers for the Alice, but there are a lot of Alices. Um, so now, it, you know, some of the names are more distinctive than others. So now I'm in the process of going through and trying to find the right Alice to see if it does appear later in the register. Um, but you can see this says, um, the brig Alice has been completely stripped by wreckers and others. All that remained this afternoon was the hull, which has been robbed of its copper sheathing and ironwork. The masks were cut away this morning. So it does sound like it was stripped down pretty well, and that's a, a good indication that it was more likely to have been left on the beach than a vessel that was more intact. Uh, that's also a good, you know, something to point out. A lot of people were coming to us and excited about, well, what are you finding? What are you finding? And, you know, it's certainly possible to find artifacts on a shipwreck, but one that was this far into the beach was most likely stripped by wreckers at the time. Um, salvage is how many people here in Hull made their living in those days, so that it probably was stripped bare to the ribs before, you know, at the time of the wreck. Um, this is another wreck, the Mary A. Hood, that happened in that area in 1894. Uh, this rescue was so difficult that Joshua James and his crew went out twice with the Life Saving Service crew and were unable to reach the wreck, so they came back and they gathered together his son Osceola and about eight of the Massachusetts Humane Society volunteer lifesavers, and with all of them in the uh, surf boat, they were able to row out and rescue the crew of the Mary Hood. Um. So this is a newspaper article at the time that quotes Joshua James as saying that he felt the vessel would work its way down into the sand and be a total loss. Um, so that's another possibility. There is a Mary A. Hood in the ship's register. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that they match exactly. Some of the information with the ships is not precisely the same, so I have to look a little bit more closely at that to make sure that they're actually the same ship, because if they're not, then the Mary Hood is a possibility. The modesty is another possibility in that area. Uh, the modesty does appear in the following year in the ship's register, though, so it's unlikely that it's the modesty. Uh, the Elrica it was a possibility that was raised by some people. The Elrica is a pretty famous shipwreck. It happened on Nantasket Beach on December 16, 1896. Uh, one of the reasons it's so famous is that while they were underway to the Elrica, Joshua James, who was 70 years old at the time and keeper of the life-saving station, was thrown from the boat. It was his job to man the steering oar, so he would stand and man the steering oar and steer out to the ship. And the steering oar was hit by a wave, and he was catapulted out of the surf boat and into the water. And he just held on to one of the other men's oars while they rowed back to the beach. And let's see if I have. <laughs> so this newspaper article says that as they pulled up on the beach, the keeper did not immediately rise. And there was a you know, silence as people thought that he was lost. And then he stood up and they said he very coolly continued the rescue as if nothing had happened, <laughs> which is very much his character. Um, I really, I just. This isn't even related to the Ken Burma shipwreck, but it's just too funny not to share. Uh, this is an article about the Elrica and uh, the Elrica crew leaving the station. They were one of the crews that was brought back and sheltered at the, what's now the Life Saving Museum for several days. And this article describes a real camaraderie that had um, developed between the Life Saving Station crew and the people of Holland, the crew of the Elrica. So they were reluctant to leave. And it says, Captain James, who is not given to flattery, says that the crew of the Ulrika were the finest looking set of seamen he ever saw, and also such has been the verdict of the women. <laughs> so <laughs> there's just never anything like that in the life savings. You know, it's always very matter of fact. So that was kind of fun. The article also says that junk thieves continue their depredations, even attempting to carry off the rigging from where it has de been deposited near the life-saving station. A constant watch is being kept at this place as well as on the wreck. Um, so I think the Elrica, you know, if you look at the picture of it on the beach, it's pretty much intact. I don't, it, they would have salvaged it if they possibly could. So I think the Elrica was most likely salvaged. Uh, and there is an Elrica 
in the uh, shifts register for the following year as well. Yeah. So that's where we are. So we have about two or three that are still likely possibilities. And of course, there's always the possibility that it's not one of those wrecks. You know, as I said, there were 150 schooners coming through every week. Um, so we're, there's that possibility too. So we'll continue to look at the wreck reports and see if we can find any further evidence. Um, now this is earlier this week. Um, this is Vic Mastone and his intern Lee uh, down at Ken Burma Beach. And we went back to see if we could do any further documentation. But the amount of change on the beach in just a month's time is absolutely amazing. Um, they drug the dug for hours these vertical trenches um, because knowing that we had uncovered about 60 feet of ship, you know that you're going to bypass it if you make a vertical trench that way. And even digging the trenches about a foot deep every few feet or so, they weren't able to uncover any of the wreck. So for the time being, it's covered over. Uh, and I think that's not the worst thing that could happen to it. You know, it survived for over 100 years under the sand. It's probably going to be OK under there for a, a good number more. Uh, and I just included a couple of articles for context. You know, I've been hearing from a lot of people, you know, it should be, it should be removed from the beach, it should be preserved. And it, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult and expensive task to do that. Um, you have to, ha even the, the size of it, that it's 60 feet, you know, you would have to construct a building to put it in. Um, not to mention that when uh, objects have been under the salt water for a long time, when they're brought out, they very quickly deteriorate unless you have really hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest um, in conservation for them. Um, so that's why, you know, for people who are wondering why it's not being further excavated. A couple of people have also asked, you know, and I've seen some comments from people that it should be roped off or it should be fenced around, but that area is completely covered at high tide, so it would be very difficult to do any kind of fencing off. And just for context, um, when I first called Vic to tell him about the wreck, he had just come from another one that's up in Salisbury that what he was working on. Um, and this is one that I actually went down and saw a few years back in Wellfleet. So these things do happen from time to time. So it's not a completely unique situation. And if, the, you know, if they were able to invest the hundreds of thousand dollars in our wreck, you know, they would be doing it up in Salisbury and on the Cape as well. And it's, they just don't have the resources to do that. So we try to document and learn as much as we can while it's visible and also be respectful and try to spread the word so that we can discourage people from removing pieces of it and leave it as intact as we can. Hold that thought. <laughs> I will. I'll tell you about that. I didn't include it in the show, but I'm glad you asked. Um, before I answer Helen's question, I just wanted to share. Vic has asked me to just share this information about the board that he works with um, that works very hard to raise public awareness about underwater archaeological resources. And they have a great website that's packed with information. So if you have questions about um, their process and what they do, I would encourage you to go to it. It's on the Mass State website. Um, and the abbreviation is the MBUAR, the Mass Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. Um, and particularly, they have a program called SHIPS the Shoreline Heritage Identification Partnership Strategy, much easier to say SHIPS. Um, and this is where they partner with local organizations and local individuals who are interested and want to help volunteer. So if you're interested in doing that, you can um, contact Vic and he can tell you a little bit more about the program. And they also have some forms that you can fill out. Um, called They have an unanticipated find form. So if you do find something on the beach and you want to document it so that it can be included in any information about the ship, a file that's made on the ship, then you can get in touch with Vic or you can get in touch with me at the museum and we can fill out a form so that we have that information and it's not lost, which would be great. So Helen was asking about the Nancy, and that's certainly one of the first questions that came up because anybody here in Hull has heard over the years that the, the keel of the Nancy is still under the beach. Uh, Vic feels quite certain that it is not the Nancy, it's just not large enough. The Nancy was a five-masted schooner and was absolutely massive. Uh, so it, the frames are just not large enough to support a vessel of that size. But maybe, maybe we'll see the Nancy one day. You never know. <laughs> um, well, I just would also like to take the opportunity to thank Bob Sullivan, who is one of our longtime members here, for so much of the information that was in the talk because he's done amazing research. So thank you, Bob, for that.